So um, Fabrice Berhardt is a co-founder and group CTO of Teodo, a fast-growing custom digital software consultancy. So please help me with a great welcome of Fabrice. Everybody. Welcome, man. Thank you, Especially thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Very happy today to share with you uh, our experience at the theater group of Dantutsu Radical Software Quality Improvement. Um, the idea of today is to share with you what I believe is a big, big challenge that we have to tackle together, which is the quality at scale dilemma in a world where software is really taking over everything, and then share with you a very exciting and actually quite recent um, um, recently published, actually, approach to radical quality in a few Toyota factories called the Dantotsu Radical Quality Improvement Program, and our experiment uh, with this Dantotsu approach in coding. And please use the Slido app to ask questions. Um, I mean, it was already mentioned, but I was asked to repeat it. So the, the Quality at scale dilemma is very important because as, as Mark Andreessen, uh, I think, s summarized really well in 2011, software is eating the world. It's been happening for 20 years uh, with American startups disrupting entire sectors using software. You know, the big, big examples are Netflix, Amazon, Airbnb. But this has accelerated in the last few years with many new players raising massive funds and, and threatening uh, incumbents using software, even in Europe. And even the recent global events that are probably going to impact our economy haven't changed Gartner's expectations of further growth in IT spending. So we're talking about $4.4 trillion invested in IT in 2022. So um, a very good news for software developers uh, like us. There's a lot of money coming towards us. Um, to the moon, right? Uh, until until the bugs start having expensive consequences. Uh, this is an example of $500 million firework. Uh, it's the first flight of Ariane uh, 5. Uh, and this explosion was caused by one line of code. Um, it's very interesting. It's a 32-bit integer that is passed to a function that expects a 16-bit integer. Uh, what is even more sad about this code, I mean, it's not really readable code. I mean, we could argue a lot that, you know, if they had used typed, a typed language and, and better viable namings, they wouldn't be there. But what is interesting is that actually the bug is in a piece of code for the horizontal alignment. And you can see just above it is the code for the vertical alignment. And so the vertical alignment actually gets it right. It takes the 32-bit integer and it clamps it. So if it's above 32,000, you know, it, it, it clamps it. If it's below minus 32, it does it. And it just, for some reason, the engineers didn't find it necessary at the time to do the same for the horizontal alignment. And it actually worked that way on Ariane 4. And then when they uh, reused the same code on Ariane 5, it caused the explosion. And that's despite the extreme quality processes in the space industry. Huh? To give you, uh, I mean, to give ourselves actually uh, an idea of what this means, um, I found this incredible example. So adding the GPS feature to the shuttle navigation required about 6,000 lines of code. So I would call it a small, you know, a small dev project. But for that, they had to write 2,500 pages of specs. And for the whole shuttle software, I think it's about 400,000 lines of code, they had to write 40,000 pages of specs. And so they're very proud of the way they work. They say, look, we write all these specs up front so we can avoid making defects. But I mean, 40,000 pages. Uh, you know, I found this very <laughs> nice photo of Margaret Hamilton. So Margaret Hamilton is uh, NASA's first a software engineer. She coded the Apollo guidance uh, computer system. So she basically coded the software that sent the first men to the moon. And this is a picture of her standing next to the source code of what she wrote. So it's as big as her. I mean, she's not that tall, but still. And that's about 11,000 pages. So 40,000 pages of specs is basically that. 
So a lot, a lot of pages. And, um, and the reason I'm insisting on that is because for me, this is really uh, uh, the dilemma we're facing now, you know. If the world becomes full of software and software goes into more and more critical systems, you know, if the electrical grid becomes an electrical smart grid, you know, if cars become software on wheels, you know, we need more and more extremely high quality software because we don't want to, uh, you know, <laughs> be in the explosion when the car has a bug. But at the same time, writing four pages of specs for every 10 lines of code doesn't seem very scalable to the, to the need for software in this world. The more traditional approach, <laughs> which we'll call move fast and break things, uh, if you've seen the social network, this is like a the still I stole from the movie. Um, well, this is definitely scalable, um, but uh, just to give you a bit like the, the difference in orders of magnitude, um, the software practices used on the shuttle produce about one defect per version, so one defect per 400,000 lines of code. And different studies seem to agree on approximately 10 to 20 defects per 1,000 lines of code as, as the industry average. So we're talking about 5,000 times more defects. So the first approach is probably not scalable, but the second approach is not acceptable. So we need to find a third approach. So this is what I call the uh, quality at scale dilemma. And, and I'm very passionate about that, but to be honest, I didn't have much a clue um, until one day, Woody comes up to me and talks about the Dantotsu approach. So Woody Rousseau is the CTO of Sipios. Uh, it's a fintech consultancy that is part of the theater group. And he got very excited about a recent book called The Toyota Way of Dantotsu Radical Quality Improvement, um, written by Sada Onomura. Uh, the title itself is very Japanese, I find. And, um, and indeed, it's quite exciting because Toyota is a company that is globally known for its obsession with quality. And I could spend hours, uh, if you want, talking about lean thinking and the Toyota production system and how it helps on quality. But I think that that would be boring. And what is really interesting, of course, is the outcome, the incredibly robust cars that you know, they build. And, and the, I think the most entertaining example of that is a Top Gear, uh, three Top Gear episodes, actually, were called Killing a Toyota, where they spent three episodes trying to kill a Toyota. So this is, a, this is at the beginning, they go soft, so they just try to you know, punch it in different ways. Then they try to drown the car, so they put it in the sea for the whole night. Uh, and at the end, because the car is still alive, they put it at the top of a 10-story block of flats, which is about to get demolished and the car goes down with the building and the explosion, and then they like roll it, and then they try to roll it around out of the, you know, out of the explosion, etc. And, and of course, I'm, I'm destroying a bit, you know, the, I'm spoiling the episode, but basically the car is still moving after three episodes, and so they decide to stop, try, to try to kill the Toyota, and they now have it in the Top Gear Museum, if you're interested to see it. So this is, this is the kind of quality that the Toyota practices have, have enabled. And so, of course, a book about how a Toyota executive um, delivered on very ambitious targets of reducing defects by 98% in factories was, was definitely going to be fascinating. Um, and this is not just in you know, the factories that have the Toyota culture, that have been part of Toyota all the time. It's, it's actually happening in a lot of factories they acquired. And so typically the Raymond Corporation is a factory they acquired in 2000. And using the Dantotsu approach, they reduced the defects from an average of 1.2 in 2006 to 0 0.004 in 2019. So the kind of order of magnitude that, that we're looking for. So very exciting. So what's the secret? Um, so I like the way the book starts because, you know, Sadao Numara starts, it's like, yes, so I visited each company regularly to, in order to grasp the individual current situations. I'm like, fine, fair enough. Then I wrote out all the problems I noticed and the countermeasures on a sheet of A3 size paper. And <laughs> I was very relieved to learn, to read, 
that writing a plan on A3 uh, size paper doesn't work. <laughs> because when I visit it again three or four months later, everything remained unchanged. So that resonates much more with my experience. You know, when I come up with great plans on how to improve quantity and I share them with people, it doesn't work. So happy to see that Sadao was also like uh, um, punched back by reality. But he's, he's a courageous person, so he starts again, <laughs> writes the A3 again, goes back to management, say, please do it really well this time. And of course, again, it doesn't work. And so Sadao Numura, who's uh, apparently quite courageous, decides to go further. And that's when he decides to go uh, to, to create something that we call a major change in my policy. And this is when he goes full on and creates what he calls the Dantotsu quantity, uh, quality activities. So, and, and no secret, of course, it's not an A3 uh, size paper. It's 300 of them and a lot, a lot of training and coaching over nine years. Um, so what does dantotsu mean to start with? So it's Japanese slang. Uh, it means something, it's like people have a hard time translating it. It means something around radical and paralleled over the top. Um, and some key points to summarize uh, the dantotsu book. So the first one, big emphasis on um, visual management of quality. So here you see, um, uh, visual management to track daily defects on the vehicles and uh, monthly uh, tracking. Uh, and on the monthly view, you can also see the ambitious goals. So the goal is to reduce so 98% is actually 50% a year during three years. So you can see here like they want to you know, reduce by 50%. Um, so that's, that's very interesting. A second point, which I thought was very, um, what's quite new to me is they don't classify defects by priority or gravity or whatever, they classify them by stages of outflow. And that's really interesting because I guess the, the radical, you know, the mental model that is radically different is to say, no defects should reach the customers. So the idea is how can I detect them earlier in the flow? So they've got uh, four categories of defects. The eight defects are those that get uh, detected in the same team, in the same shop floor. B defects are defects that get detected by a team further down the line. Uh, C defects are those that are detected at final inspection. And of course, the worst of them, the D defects is when they actually are detected in the car bought by a customer. Um, on this classification, they also classify by source of origin, which I thought was quite interesting. And I'll talk a bit about that later because it's, it's actually quite game changing. So they ask themselves, you know, where did the defect uh, originate from, you know? Is it from production engineering? Is it from supplier? Or is it from welding, painting, etc.? So no priority, but two dimensions, where it got detected and where's the source. A key point number three, um, Dantotsu is very much based on the huge involvement of the team leader in the quality, um, so using what they call an eight-step procedure for every defect. So for every defect, the team leader is really key. Uh, they have to check the defective part right away. They have to check if there's other parts that have been affected. And then they need to investigate the causes um, through interviews with workers, for example. Then they have to implement the countermeasure. Then they have to share the learnings the next day. <laughs> I reveal something. So they have to share the learning with the, with the team. Um, then they have to look at the current standards. So standards are basically the training materials. So create new training material or update it. Then make sure that if, uh, if the defect showed like uh, skill gaps, make sure to uh, train the workers. And, and then of course, as a team leader, just ensure on the long term that things get done you know, in the better way. Um, not only is this quite uh, you know, thorough, it's also very intense because actually the first four steps are done on the same day and the next four steps are supposed to be done the next day. So there's a 24 reaction for every defect. So very, very intense uh, for the team leader on quality. And I thought, I mean, doing the parallel already, I thought, you know, there's no mention of uh, backlog refinements or, you know, different meetings. You know, it's really on the shop floor trying to uh, improve quantity. 
Um, key point number four, so systematic approach to defect analysis. Um, so they use this kind of uh, uh, framework that is presented here where they look at you know, details of defects, co causes, and then countermeasures. What I found super interesting when I read this part of the book is that I've been debating for a long time when I analyze bugs. We've been analyzing uh, bugs uh, at Theodore Group for, about, for yeah, 10 years now. And the debate is often between, I'd say, the testing passionates um, who say, oh yeah, we could have avoided the bug by you know, doing more unit tests, do, do, doing better end-to-end -end testing, these kind of things. And, and, and let's say another part of the people who say, yeah, testing is nice, but it's also about you know, designing a better architecture, doing a better, better domain-driven design, etc. And so, um, so I've been fighting that battle. I was more on the prevention side of the battle rather than the testing side. Um, and it was very interesting to read the Dan Totsu book because they've got, they finally settled the debate. Uh, the answer is very simple. They look at cause of occurrence and cause of outflow. So they're basically looking at both. So I was happy to finally realize I've been wrong debating this for so long, and I should have just been doing both the whole time. Um, and key point number five, um, which is to be expected for such radical quality improvements, is that as soon as a defect appears more than one, two, three times, actually, I think three is, is the threshold they use, then they really invest in systems to make sure, you know, to leave no chance for the defect to appear again. And so they give this example of defects that are due to consumables not being perfectly, you know, people not taking exactly the right one or taking one that is a bit old or whatever. So they come up with this really, you know, very smart and, you know, total system to make sure that these kind of uh, issues on consumables will never happen again. So this, this is my you know, short summary of the book, but I, I of course invite you to read the book um, if, because it's, it's a very rich uh, book. I mean, there's so many things. It's, it's made out of 300 uh, A3 science papers. So basically, Sadao Nomura uh, kept on writing A3 papers and put them all together, and that's the book. So it's not, it's not the easiest read, but it's, 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 it's still very interesting. So our experiment in Datsufu Kurd, so, um, so the first thing we did is, uh, I think the first reaction for us was to standardize our definition of defect in the group. Um, so that was quite a debate, <laughs> quite controversial, but we decided to uh, define defects as any unexpected behavior for the user. And I'll tell later a bit how we addressed some other frustrations around that. Um, but yeah, the idea is if the user didn't expect it, then it's a defect. So it's quite large. But at least, you know, once we had that, it was clear. Um, so then that, was, that allowed us to really standardize a bit the way we measure bugs uh, around the company, and we tried different ways of uh, um, measuring them visually. We even tried on paper, because there's a, there's a paragraph where Sadao Nomura says, don't use a computer, computers are bad. So we tried on paper. <laughs> but unfortunately, in our post-COVID environment, uh, you know, it was, it's a bit difficult to experiment on paper. So we've, we've built a tool to um, track defects on projects and actually a nice tool to track defects at company level. And then we standardized our outflow classification. So um, the idea was to look a bit at the steps and how we could bring detection earlier in the process. So, uh, so we added uh, one category. <laughs> because, and probably that's the difference between the car and, and software, is um, we decided that there were two types of defects in production. Those that you find in production, but nobody complained about them, and those that actually triggered a, a, a complaint on Zendesk, for example. So E defects, a defect that generated a complaint. D defects in production. C detected in inspection, so that can be QA if you have QA or it can be the product owner if, you, if the team tests themselves. Um, then B, B defects are detected by the dev team. Uh, so code review, function review, these kind of things. And we even went um, quite radical in this and created the A defect, so a defect detected by the dev while coding. And I'll tell you a bit more about this because it's quite fun. 
Um, and then we clarified that defects can originate from different teams. So yes, you've got dev defects, but you also have content defects, third-party API defects, ops defects, product defects. So a few examples here, but typically, if a defect in production is because the hard disk is full, you can say, you know, hard disk, full, that's an ops issue, for example. Or one that was very controversial that I liked very much, you know, if the user complains because there's a button that says login, and the user is like, you know, what the fuck does login mean? Because they're French, and they don't speak English, and they never used the word login before, then you can say it's a content defect. So, because devs were really like, you know, that's, it's not my problem if the user doesn't speak English. Which inspired me this nice meme that I, you know, hope you will appreciate, um, that I think summarized well the debates internally, and at least settled the debate. So, and so then we experimented with, uh, so now that we had like kind of standardized all that and really got into experimenting with, with the approach. So, um, so the team lead became the tech lead for us um, and the idea was really to start with analyzing a bug fix a day. Uh, so that's typically the template we're using. So that's a notion, a screenshot of notion. Um, um, so you've got a quick screenshot of the the, the diff for the, the for the fix, short description, and then you can see there's uh, learnings on both how we could have prevented it and how we could have detected it earlier with like potential countermeasures. Um, and indeed, we put the tech lead at the heart of quality again, which means uh, uh, we're not we're not enforcing the idea that the tech lead should fix the defect, but we kind of we kind of said okay, if 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 we don't know who should fix it, then the tech lead should fix it. Um, and then that makes it much easier for them to analyze it. So we clearly said, okay, the tech lead analyzes the defect and the fix, actually. Um, they're in charge also of checking other parts of the code base uh, for similar defects and um, come up with uh, the potential countermeasures. And then they share the learnings and they share the suggested countermeasures with the team uh, the next day during a, a daily, uh, I mean it's, we don't have a name yet for it, but I call it the bug fix analysis coffee. So 10, 15 minutes with the team to say, yes, you know, I've, I've fixed that defect. These are the learnings. This is what I want to do. What do you think? And then the team, if the team agrees with the, the countermeasures, then they're taken, and they're not urgent, then they're taken in the next sprint. So example of countermeasures, I thought that was quite interesting. So. Um, um, around detection, a lot about linter rules, adding tests, so unit tests, end-to-end uh, -end tests. Uh, some of them were about improving test data, so test fixtures, uh, typically edge cases that you know testing didn't catch, but actually were you know relevant enough to create. Uh, some of the countermeasures include rewriting parts of the code, which I, I found actually very exciting. So the idea that you finally it's, it's uh, I didn't find a name yet for it, but I'd say, you know, fixed driven rewrite, where, you, you know, when you go to the product owner or the business and you say, we need to rewrite the permission system, you know, you don't have to justify that it's based on your intuition. You can say, oh, we've had two defects in the permission system already. You know, I think it's time to spend a week rewriting it. Um, sometimes, it's, I'm talking about big, big rewrites, but sometimes it can actually be very small refactorings. Uh, because often you can, you can the, the fix can point to namings that are really unclear or you know, lead to confusion, so improving the domain-driven design. And then on the more, I'd say, team level, it's about, uh, it can be about creating or improving training material or just training a member who's, uh, on which we identify the skill gap. And so, we even experimented with A defects. So what are A defects? Uh, so we decided that to define them as when the code isn't working as expected at the first manual test by the coder. So basically the game is you're only allowed one refresh in the browser or the phone simulator. And if it doesn't work at the first refresh, it's an A defect. 
So one refresh only, and that was, I thought, quite bold by uh, the guy who came up with the ID. Um, but when you think about it, you know, coding is about you know, going back and forth between the code and the, brow and the browser or the phone simulator and, and, and deciding that actually we try to not do that, you know, it could be fun and it could, it could make f people feel better and it could also be a very interesting experiment in terms of quality. So they gamified it, so the teams that tried that gamified it, so they, they called it the right the first time, and so if you get the right the first time, you get an award. You even have a Slack bot uh, congratulating you every time. And it really promotes uh, not only like celebration of quality, but also thinking before coding. And I think it promoted TDD in the most uh, value-driven way I've, I've ever seen. So instead of saying TDD is good, you know, for a lot of reasons, all of a sudden you say, you do whatever you want, but you're only allowed one refresh. And then all of a sudden people are like, oh, if I could test in the, in the command line with, you know, code, etc. oh, yeah, let, let me talk to you about TDD. So it's really uh, uh, improved the quality in these teams. So learnings, learnings. Um, well, a learning that is quite recent is... Um, that putting so much effort at the defect level um, makes you lose sometimes, uh, you know, the big picture. Um, and, and so, and the risk is you like, you know, you invest a lot in like correcting all these issues, but don't actually see that the architecture needs like, you know, a big change or something like that. So interestingly enough, we reacted by, but it's been very recent, so I can't tell you yet about it because it's only been a few weeks. But now we make sure that teams that do that have a very good visual representation of their architecture. And so we can map the defects on the architecture. What is very interesting is that when preparing this conference, I realized that they actually talk about that in the book. I had a bit overlooked about it. And so what they call weak point management, which is when they have more than three times the same defect, they actually map them on like a visual representation of, of the engine. So very interesting, and so the idea, of course, is to connect the micro learnings from the defect to the big picture system, you know, tech architecture, but even product. The other learning is that uh, we've done it, we've started introducing these practices on large ongoing projects, and the results will take months. I mean, the tech leads were very excited, you know, it, and of course there's the bias that it's something new and shiny, so it's gonna be exciting anyway, but yeah, it's, it gave them a tool as tech leads to like work on quality rather than you know being pulled in yet another backlog refinement. But the analysis, you know, when we look at the root causes, they're often dating back nine months. So you're kind of thinking, wow, you know, all the efforts I'm putting in now will be measurable in nine months. But so on the first project, we adopted uh, right the first time from the start. Uh, so it's a small project, it's uh, 5,789 lines of code as of yesterday morning, uh, 118 engineer days, a uh, team of three engineers. And the numbers are two defects in production, so two D defects, and two defects in inspection, so two C defects. And that's, if you like, normalize them, that means we're about 0 0.3 defects per thousand lines of code and 0.02 defects per engineer day. This is, this is really one order of magnitude better than what we see in, in other projects. So very, very exciting. And um, if you look back at you know, the two approaches I've suggested, uh, this doesn't bring us yet to uh, space, uh, space software quality yet, but we're talking about one to two orders of magnitude better than the uh, industry standard. So that puts them way above them. So that's very exciting. And also what is very exciting is the team had a lot of fun doing it. So it's much, much more scalable to a million of devs than, uh, than writing 40,000 pages of specs. So yes, the conclusion of that is that um, this little experiment has been for the moment very exciting, uh, very inspiring. And Dan Totsu brings me the uh, inspiring alternative that I was looking to scale quality. And so we'll definitely continue to explore it. You know, it's gonna be a long journey, but it's gonna be very much fun. 
And if you want to uh, follow me on the journey, you can follow me on Twitter at Fabrice B or email me directly. I'd be very delighted to connect. Thank you very much. Fabrice, thank you so much for this refreshment material and, and fresh presentation. I think that we have some questions. I don't know if, yeah. So <clears throat> let's start with the first one. Did Nomura-san mention any specific advantages, paper-based visualization? Wait, 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 wait. Yes. Or Teno computing? So yes, that's very interesting. It's uh, in lean thinking. Um, Visual management is very important because it's what ensures that teams see the problems um, and, and therefore are more inclined to react to them. Uh, he's very much against computers because the cost of inputting on the computer and also the fact that it's a closed system means that the workers on the, you know, on the shop floor, I mean, to, to go back to the, the environment, we're talking about people in a factory. So, I mean, they're working hard all day they don't have time to go have fun on the computer. Uh, so so I, think, I think it makes a lot of sense for him. We've, you know, until COVID hit, we were all paper-based and we fought a lot to stay paper-based exactly for that reason. Um, so COVID has hit, so we've gone full online and it's worked. But I've seen people go back to the paper-based approach to make sure that you have like a, it's ba it basically means you have like a, a kind of a, an item that the team can like uh, gather around, which also makes it, I think, you know, we're, we're talking a bit like soft, soft skills, but makes makes it more interesting than, than on a computer. Great. We have two really popular. Let's start with the why is only the team leader analyzing bugs? Isn't this restricting not using your resources in a good way? Um, so this is a very interesting question. So the reality is we're not enforcing that rule. So multiple answers to that. The first answer is why do they do that at Toyota? So Toyota, the idea is very much, you've got the factory workers working and the team leader is there to um, support them. So everything that is outside of uh, everyday work, that's the team leader's responsibility. So that's the way they look at it. Uh, in the case of software development, so if you're very agile, you shouldn't have that kind of differentiation of roles. So, so the answer should be, you shouldn't do that. Um, I liked the idea that, that's a very personal point of view, but because I find it very exciting to analyze bugs, uh, I consider it the best part of my day. Uh, I thought I would make it a, an attractive um, reward when you become tech lead, you get to analyze bugs. Um, but I think more generally, I like the idea of, of, of Toyota where, you know, to ensure that things are working well. Of course, the team can analyze bugs, but when they don't have time, for some reason, there's pressure on delivery, then there's like this responsibility that the team leader has to step in. So I would say I, I turn it around. It's not the team leader has to analyze bugs. It's more that someone has to analyze bugs and it's the team leader's responsibility to make sure it happened. Awesome. And the most popular, 5,500 lines of code is very little. Have you considered that you have a low count of bugs due to minor complexity that you have yet? So, of course, this is one anecdotal evidence. Uh, I don't think that counts as a hard science yet. Um, the project is not that very big, but, you know, 5,000 lines of code is not that small either. It's, uh, it's like three, four months of work for one team. So it's not, it's not like a two-day project. Huh? Um, and uh, yes, of course, the project is a bit simpler. The team was very engaged, thanks to you know, this right the first time gamification. Uh, so all that is true. There's a strong bias there. However, the fact it's like one to two orders of magnitude better is, I'd say, much better than expected for us. So that's why it's still very encouraging and we'll continue to, to, to do that. Okay. Um we have still two really popular. How much overhead was introduced by how much did the velocity decrease for teams that introduced the method? So that's a big idea of lean thinking, and I think this experiment was a good reminder of that. The biggest waste is rework. So the biggest sink of time is, is rework. So when you do things right the first time, you go faster. So the answer is there's no cost apart from 
you know, having to think harder. Fabrice, you are on fire. There are many questions, <laughs> and I appreciate the engagement of the people. So how does this approach affect the delivery time of a product? Um, so that's actually a so real-life experiment. Um, uh, so, it's, so the way we do the approach is on bug fixes. So already first huge bias, the bugs that don't get fixed don't get analyzed in the current approach. So the PO still has too much say, I would say, on quality. So that's point number one. At least for C and D bugs. Of course, for A and B bugs, that's the team's responsibility to, to, to fix them. Um, so it depends. If the quality is high, then you don't need the PO's uh, input, so it's fine. If the quality is low, then of course the PO has the ability to, to prioritize. So that's the first thing. The second thing is you analyze the bug fix, you come up with countermeasures, and what has happened in some teams is that the product owner didn't agree with the countermeasures and therefore, again, deprioritized quality for, um, for whatever delivery pressure. Uh, so this is something we're working on because we believe that um, we're not clear yet on the strategy, but my strategy would be to say you need, like, if it's pulled by a fix, so fix-driven uh, quality improvement, then it should automatically go in the next sprint. Right. I skipped also another really popular. Do you have a comparison between cost for this method versus cost of bugs, um, if you are willing to ignore some bugs on the PO level? I, I, I thought that was the question I answered. Really? Oh, yeah. Okay. Sorry. So, wait for me here, just Sorry, sorry. There's someone, like, raising their hand at the back? No? Okay, just stretching. <laughs> so, Fabrice, uh, in, in all the mouth of our uh, organizer, thank you, Fabrice, for your wonderful talk at Craft. Oh, and thank please you. help me with a nice applause to Fabrice. Thank you very much.